it's Mark from the United States. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Mark from the States, how are we doing today? I am doing fantastic. Got something in my eye here. I hope you are as well. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate each and every one of you. You know that I do. Thank you so much for coming. Come sit on this big fake couch. I'm going to learn something today. Hopefully, you do too. Um, I'm sure, who knows, probably most of you know uh, about this guy, but uh, today we're going to learn about a, uh, the pacifist with the Victoria Cross. Now, of course, I'm familiar with the uh, story of Desmond Doss, the American from World War II in the Pacific, the pacifist, the, the movie Hacksaw Ridge, really good, good film, um, fun to watch, uh, crazy story about that guy um, and all the people he went back and rescued. A lot of the things that you saw in that movie are like, there's no way this happened, but uh, it actually did. It was crazy. Um, so very unique individual. Uh, well, apparently there was someone who did that uh, before him in World War I, who was awarded the Victoria Cross. Uh, this gentleman's name, I believe, uh, William Coltman, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so the title of the video is William Colton VC, Britain's Hacksaw Ridge. It is from our good friend, History Chap. Please go and support his channel. It's so important that you do. I cannot stress this enough. The only reason I'm able to do this and and is because of people like Chris over at History Chap uh, channel and the many others that I do. I'm not going to, oh, I say that, um, I like to get permission. <laughs> Let me just say that. So it does limit who I can watch. It does. Uh, I've sent emails out to a bunch. A lot of them don't respond, but a few do. And so I'm so grateful that they do respond and even more blessed when they say, yeah, we'd love for you to uh, react to our videos. You know, that's why I stress on having you go over and support their channel. It's important. It really is. Um, I'm here to learn. Those people, uh, you know, a lot of them, uh, you know, that's what they do for, that's their career. They do this for a living. Uh, or it's a, a, a serious side gig. Either way, um, I'm here to learn, not to get rich. So I am wanting, yes, of course I have, my videos do get monetized, you know, but we're talking pennies here. <laughs> But these people are kind enough to, to allow me to learn from their stuff and see cool and amazing things. And, um, you know, I don't want to have to go, uh, you know, before I used to just watch whatever you said. And I got strikes a bunch of times. And, I, and even when I wasn't getting strikes, I still felt guilty. Now, there are some, of course, the big corporations I've sent emails, but I'll never get a response. But, you know, the BBCs, the, the big, the big channels, you know, um, heck, I even sent the Royal, uh, even asked the Royal family for permission and they were awesome to say yes. Well, their people were anyway. Uh, I like to think that the King actually gave me his blessing, uh, personally. <laughs> and, uh, um, Gosh, I hope he's doing really good. And same with Kate. God, that just is terrible. But anyway, the point I'm making is, is I, I really prefer to watch videos of people who have given me their blessing to do it. And so when I do a video, and unfortunately, a lot of negative comments come out on the people who did the video, I'm going to, if, I mean, the, the last one we did on uh, York, a good 80% of the comments were negative towards them. And I was surprised. I really was surprised. And so I just turned the comments off. So yes, I turned the comments off. Because that's not the point of the video. The point of the video 
is whether the video is good, whether the video is bad, whether the people in the video uh, drove you crazy or whatever. Uh, the point of me was seeing was to see the, the city of York. And I thought, I really enjoyed the video. I, I thought they were a fun couple. And, and I'm not saying you can't have your opinions. You could totally have your opinions. And I have never blocked comments before. But this was our first time watching it. And it was overwhelmingly negative. And I just was like, man, that's cool that you have that opinion. I'm totally fine with that. But, you know, I want to be able to watch their videos <laughs> and not have it just, you know, the whole comment section just banging on them. That's all. Um, if you have something, you know, you know, a hardcore critique, that's totally fine. You can also email it to me. But uh, it was just surprising. That uh, it the that video it, it never happened before. Let me state that it had never happened before, where you guys were uh, the majority uh, of people were having a problem with it. So uh, I just shut off the comments because that wasn't the point of the video. The ironically, you know, the ironic thing about the whole video is that the video was you know did pretty well. A lot of people saw it, is what I mean. And uh, the likes were, I think we had one dislike, which was crazy. So I don't know what to make of it. Now, am I wrong for shutting off the comments? You'll have to let me know. Um, that was just a decision I made after 24 hours that I was just reading this. And it was just like, there wasn't anything constructive in there for me to learn from. You know, it was just, I didn't like them. <laughs> you know, and... and was like uh, well, I didn't know what to make with that you know I didn't know what to do with that so it wasn't helping me learn so that's why the comments were shut off so right or wrong on my part I don't know you'll have to let me know so uh, again my email in the description of every video I am don't get me wrong I am truly blessed for all of you <clears throat> and I and I'm just going to write it off as a one-off scenario because it's never happened before. So I'm just going to say, okay, moving on. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, learning, back to learning. The pacifist with the Victoria Cross. I am excited to learn this. Come sit on this big fake couch. And let's see who this William Colton is. Let's do it. How did a pacifist end up receiving the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest medal for bravery? Well, it happened in the First World War, and it happened because this amazing hero, who'd volunteered to join the army in the opening months of the war, had a deep religious calling, which made him lay down his rifle and to pick up a stretcher. Hi, I'm Chris Green, the History Chap, telling stories that bring British history to life. And today, I want to share the story of this humble five foot four hero, from Burton-on-Trent in Staffordshire. William Coltsman VC was a stretcher bearer on the Western Front. His bravery wasn't just rewarded with the Victoria Cross, but with two distinguished service medals and two military medals as well, which is a pretty impressive record for a deeply religious pacifist. William Coltsman was born just outside the town of Burton-on-Trent in 1891 the youngest of nine children to his parents, Charles and Anne. On leaving school, he worked as a market gardener. It was around this time that William became a member of the Plymouth Brethren. He remained a deeply religious man for the rest of his life, and his faith would inspire his subsequent actions during the First World War. So Plymouth Brethren, is that what he said? Is that a order of some sort of religious, sounds like? Interesting. 5'4". He's only 5'4". That's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> That's what I've shrunk to. It's terrible. Uh, but yeah, even, even at 5'4", we can do great things. Yes! In 1913, William married Eleanor May Dolman, a domestic servant and two years his junior. Married life, however, would be interrupted by the First World War the following year. In January 1915, 
the 5 foot 4 23 year old William Coltman volunteered to serve his country in the First World War. Just to make it absolutely clear, Coltman was not a conscientious objector. Okay. He volunteered within five months of the outbreak of the war to serve. And he joined the 6th Battalion of the North Staffordshire Regiment, the Prince of Wales's, and initially carried a rifle. Uh. Although he only just got in. At five foot four, he was just one inch above the minimum height requirement. And many smaller <laughs> men would be turned away and would only get their chance to serve when a member of parliament, Alfred Bigland, obtained permission to form his own battalion of shorter men. In fact, I'm thinking of telling the story of oh my these God, men, yeah. Bigland's Bantams, in a future episode. Please do. But what do you Chris. think? Type yes in the comments if you'd like to hear it. Unlike the Pals battalions, formed by eager young men joining up en masse in response to Lord Kitchener's Your Country Needs You posters, Coltman's battalion were a territorial army battalion. In other words, they were a reserve unit and thus were being readied for immediate deployment, unlike the raw Pals. In fact, they were one of the first full TA battalions to be sent to France, arriving in March 1915, just two months after our market gardener from Burton had joined them. The 6th were part of the 46th North Midland Division of the 137th Brigade and initially saw action at the Battle of Luz in the September of that year. It was whilst trapped in a shell hole one night and listening to the cries of the wounded in no man's land that Coltsman came to the conclusion that he could not fire his rifle in anger and cause similar pain. Ooh, that must he have been... He put in a request to become a stretcher bearer. That mu- okay, so yeah, Desmond Doss was that going in so they there was the the whole deal should he even be allowed to go in but he was already there when he made that decision so this is going to be uh probably dealt or you know uh you know met with a lot of resistance here or ill will if you to put it some other way yeah there's going to be some issues here <laughs> Now, if you think that being a stretcher bearer was somehow a cushy number or well out of danger, then think again. Unarmed, these men would go out into no man's land and whilst under sniper, machine gun and shell fire, locate and then carry wounded soldiers back to British lines. They're like sitting ducks. through thick mud. One stretcher bearer unit recorded 42 of their number killed or wounded out of 48. Not only was their work dangerous and difficult, but it was hard oh, too. Look at that photo right there. Knee deep. This guy right here. Knee deep. Now, if that's me, I'm probably waist deep. <laughs> but uh yeah, not easy carrying. There was a time I I did a commercial. Yeah, yeah, you're looking at a TV star here. Uh, I did a commercial way back when for Jim Beam. <clears throat> and it was a World War I uh, set uh, story. And it was about uh, a guy who got hurt, was taken back to the uh, tent. God, I wish I could find it out there and show it to you. Um, there was a guy who um, got injured, went back to the medical tent or whatever, and... Uh, they were, he was given some Jim Beam uh, before they had to, you know, cut his leg, his leg off or something, his arm off, or I can't remember which, but they had to amputate. And, but all the people that were getting amputations were given Jim Beam. So they were like, cut off more things because they loved Jim Beam so much. That was the premise. So there's a scene where I played a stretcher bearer um, and had to carry a guy and we had to do the take over and over and over now granted we're on solid ground it is not easy on these old type stretchers carrying a human body now combine that with the mud that is insane and then having to deal with the fire and you know, but it was really cool doing the uh, the shoot because I was able to you know I had period outfit wardrobe uniform <clears throat> um, and had to do the take over and over and over 
literally two seconds of the commercial is me uh, carrying, you know, this wounded soldier back to the medical tent. Uh, a lot of fun. Long day. And, you know, these uniforms were, I don't know, wool. Very hot. <laughs> but a lot of fun. And I may have partaked in some Jim Bean afterwards. So that was always fun as well. So, uh, but yeah, I, while not uh, experiencing what these guys experienced in the mud and the, the explosions and the gunfire and, and the war around me, it was, uh, I did get a little taste of what it was like carrying a person on one of those stretchers. It was just me and another dude front and back. It was nuts. It was nuts. Anyway, back to the video. Normally, there would be 16 stretcher bearers assigned to a battalion of 1,000 men. And it would take six or even eight stretcher bearers to lift the dead weight of a wounded soldier. Now imagine carrying that weight through the mud and churned up landscape. Yeah. Whilst it, under insane. fire. And now imagine that there are 100 wounded men out there needing your help. No wonder many of these teams worked until they dropped from exhaustion. William Coltman was sent on a six-week basic medical and stretcher training course. During that time, he, like other stretcher bearers, was taught basic life-saving first aid. The role of stretcher bearers was to provide that immediate relief before carrying the wounded to the regimental aid post just behind the front line. Here, a doctor, the regimental medical officer, and a small team of orderlies would provide a triage service. I've told the story of two of these medical officers who were awarded Victoria Crosses in previous episodes, Noel Chavas and Artin Martha Leake. They are two of only three men ever to be awarded the VC twice. Check out those stories later. I'll post a link in the description. From the regimental aid post, the more serious cases would be sent further back to the main advanced dressing station and thence to hospitals if needed. So the stretcher bearers were a crucial part in the caring for the wounded process. Indeed, they were vital. And all they had to identify themselves to the enemy was a small white armband with the letters SB, stretcher bearer. Ah, uh, they didn't red. have the cross Sometimes yet. a red cross would also be added. Okay. The 6th Battalion, North yeah, Staffordshire I'd... Regiment, were part of the 46th Division's attack on Goncourt during the opening day of the Battle of the Somme in July 1916. The attack was a catastrophic failure and the 46th Division suffered over 2,400 casualties. That's a lot of work for stretcher bearers. Damn. William Coltman was mentioned in dispatches for his work. The following year, February 1917, Coltman was awarded the Military Medal for rescuing an officer. The officer had been leading a small wiring party in no man's land when the mist that had been covering them lifted and they came under fire from the German positions. The officer was shot in the thigh and Coltman went forward by himself and carried him to safety. Nice. In July, he was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal when over several days, he ventured out to evacuate the wounded under shell fire. His citation acknowledged that he undoubtedly saved many lives and concluded, his absolute indifference to danger had a most inspiring effect upon the rest of his men. Just a month later, he was awarded a bar to his military medal. In other words, the second time he was mm -hmm. awarded this medal. This time it was for three acts of bravery back in June before he had received his DCM. The first occurred on the 6th of June, 1917, when an ammunition dump was hit by mortar fire. Coltman took it upon himself to run into the danger to remove a stock of very lights. Bef I'll go back a little bit, but you see there, they have the red cross on their arm there now. That is, uh, yeah, and when in the middle of fire, you can't tell. <laughs> I mean, and I assume the stretcher bearers going out in the middle of nowhere there in no man's land, they're just easy pickings to, to, to shoot. I don't know what... <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know what the the official uh, rule is on that sort of thing, but um, sitting ducks, though, just out. <sighs> Crazy. He took it upon himself to run into the danger to remove a stock of very lights before they could explode. The following day, he took a leading role in tending the wounded when the company headquarters was also hit by German mortar fire. The third of the three events that led to his second military medal was when he dug into a collapsed tunnel to rescue the men inside. 
By the time he was once more recognised for his bravery in 1918, the war was turning in favour of the Allies. After the initial scare of the German Spring Offensive in 1918, the Allies had started to finally push the Germans back. In preparation for a major assault on the Germans' defensive position, called the Hindenburg Line, in September, the 46th Division moved forward to clear the area around Belenglis, close to the San Quentin Canal. Lance Corporal William Coltman once more went out to find the wounded, dressing and carrying many of them back to safety whilst under heavy artillery fire. He continued to work through the night and into the next day without taking any rest until all the wounded in front of their regiment had been brought back to their lines. For this action, he was awarded a bar to his Distinguished Conduct Medal. That day, the 29th of September 1918, the Allied assault on the Hindenburg Line began in earnest. Look at those things. Dang. You'll have to explain what's on top there. I know some modification they put on these tanks. I'm not quite sure. Do those, do those roll off to be able to span gaps, maybe? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what those are. I'm, I know there's a bunch of you out there that know what those, what those things are on top of the tank there, but just gnarly looking things. The fear of seeing one of those tanks for the very first time must have just been crazy. But this guy, William Colton, he just kept going, kept getting more bars added to his chest. That's a... This dude's, dude's awesome. William Colton, well done, sir. With the North Staffordshire's part of the 137th Division as it spearheaded the attack across the canal. The Battle of San Quentin Canal was preceded by the greatest British military artillery bombardment of the war. 1,600 guns fired over 1 million shells onto the German positions. Through thick fog and smoke, the British infantry then used life belts and collapsible boats to cross the canal before scaling the steep banks on the far side to capture the German machine gun positions and a vital bridge across the canal. Over the following days, they broke into the forward positions of the Hindenburg Line. By the 3rd of October, they'd taken the main line and also the support line, and now the North Staffs moved forward to attack the third supporting line, just to the northeast of the village of Sekar, about five miles east of the canal. In a bayonet charge, they reached the supporting trench, only to now come under heavy machine gun and artillery fire from the Germans overlooking them on the nearby Mannequin Hill. The infantry couldn't make any headway against that overwhelming firepower from above, and as more and more men fell, the commanding officer reluctantly ordered his men to fall back. And as they fell back under that murderous machine gun fire, they left their wounded comrades where they'd fallen. As they tried to regroup under cover, the cries of those wounded in front of Mannequin Hill filled the air. Men in pain, men feeling very lonely and scared, men knowing that they would die. Lance Corporal William Coltman remembered that night in his shell hole, that night that had tortured his Christian sense of compassion and had led him to lay down his rifle and take up a stretcher. He knew what he had to do now, and he ran forward. Men trying to find what cover there was available watched as the five-foot-four man from Burton-on-Trent kept running. Bullets kicked up around him from the German enfilade fire. The soldier lying wounded in no man's land knew that his injuries were bad. He couldn't move, and from the pain as well as the blood, he knew he was going to die. Suddenly beside him was Coltman, breaking open his small satchel and administering first aid. Then the stocky little market gardener had picked up the wounded Tommy and carrying him over his shoulders, he made his way, once more under fire, back to the rest of the regiment. For the next 48 hours, without any sleep, he went out into no man's land, administering first aid, collecting documents from the dead for their families, and on a further two occasions, carrying men over his shoulders to safety. That's a cool point. Not only is he going out there to, to save guys, you know, do first aid, that sort of thing, he's also getting documents 
and other belongings from the dead, so for the families, and stuff you don't really hear about. Uh, that's, but it's so important. It's such a big deal for the families. I mean, you wonder, it might, you might be able to get it after everything's over, but you know, a lot of that stuff's probably lost in the mud. <laughs> Just amazing. Wow. Back. Just kept going back. That's where his 5'4 frame has definitely helped him, being able to get out there and maneuver around, for sure. And you've got to be in just phenomenal shape, too. You're crazy. Lance Corporal William Coltman was awarded Britain's highest medal for valour, the Victoria Cross. Back in his hometown, he was a hero, and crowds flocked to the railway station to welcome him home. Forewarned of the reception that he was about to receive, William Coltman, VC, jumped off the train one stop before Burton-on-Trent and yeah. walked the final few miles, slipping quietly into the family home. No way. Demobilised in 1919, mm. he did have one last role to play in regard to the First World War. On the 11th of November 1920, the coffin of Britain's unknown warrior was laid to rest at Westminster Abbey. It had been borne on a gun carriage down Whitehall in front of a silent crowd numbering thousands. Pausing at the cenotaph, the gun carriage then slowly moved on to Westminster Abbey. Either side of it was an escort of pallbearers drawn from Britain's most senior military commanders from the recent war. Included in that escort were Field Marshal Lord Haig, Field Marshal Lord French, Admiral Lord Beatty, and Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Trenchard. Behind them, solemnly followed the royal family. The coffin entered the abbey to the choir, singing, unaccompanied, O Valiant Hearts. Following a short service, the coffin was carried to the west end of the nave to be interred. As it made its way to its final resting place, it passed through a guard of honour formed by 100 holders of the Victoria Cross. Included in their number, William Coltman, VC. Oh. With his Victoria Cross, two distinguished conduct medals, and two military medals. He was the most decorated member of that Guard of Honour. Wow. Not even the commander of that honour party. Honor. Lieutenant Colonel Bernard Freyberg VC could match him. <laughs> Returning to Burton-on-Trent, William became a gardener in the Town Parks Department. Of course. And whilst he would attend Staffordshire Regimental reunions, he would always take a back seat and rarely talked about his wartime experiences, even to his family. The only acknowledgement of the war was that he named his house Sequa after the village near Mannequin Hill. During the Second World War, he was commissioned in the Army Cadet Force. He rose to the rank of captain, commanding the Burton-on-Trent Detachment until the early 1950s. He and Eleanor were to have two children and four grandchildren, and remained married until 1948, when Eleanor died of cancer, aged 55. William Harold Coltman, VC, DCM and Bar, MM and Bar, died in 1974, at the ripe old age of 82. Wow. He's buried in the graveyard Incredible. at St. Mark's Church, Winsor, just on the edge of his hometown of Burton. He'd continue to attend Plymouth Brethren meetings until the very end. His medals were on display at the Staffordshire Regiment Museum, just outside Lichfield. Sometime before his death, William Coltman VC expressed the hope that future generations would know nothing of war, except what they read in books, and there would come a time where no Victoria Crosses would need to be awarded. Uh. Profound sentiments from a humble, deeply religious, and incredibly brave man. There are so many amazing stories from the First World War. I mentioned my episodes about Noel Shabas and also Arthur Martin Leake, who were medical officers and both awarded the VC twice. And I've also told stories about two brave army chaplains, Theodore Hardy and Woodbine Willie. I've got plenty more stories from the uh. First World War in the pipeline, including teenage VC recipient Jack Cornwell at the Battle of Jutland and some of the lesser-known theatres of that war. Albert Ball, yeah. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, go support Chris over at History Chap. so important that you do so. And you all know it. Um, it's important. It really is. He's a great dude, and uh, I love getting his emails all the time. Join his club. He's got a little club, and he sends emails, gives you the updates of what he's doing. He's he's awesome. He really is, and he'll respond if you email him. 
him and I have had some correspondence and it, it's just been great. It's been great. Uh, thank you for all of you for coming and hanging out. I appreciate each and every one of you. I really do. Um, so you guys are amazing. Hope everybody's happy, healthy, and safe. This, this guy was amazing. Incredible. And of course he was there for the, uh, for that ceremony of the burial of the, of the warrior, unknown warrior. One of the more moving stories uh, that I've seen on, you know, doing our channel here was uh, that whole story about that. Just, I want to see it. That's one of the first things I do want to see. I'll probably get to the pubs, but then, you know, I'd like to get over there and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing and paying my respects to them. Uh, really cool. Anyway, have a great day, everybody, and we will see you in the next one. Take care. Bye. Mark from the States. Mark from the States. It's Mark.